scripture reading for this morning comes from Mark 9. We'll be reading verses 2 through 9. And then we'll also be reading Isaiah 54, verse 10. Hear now the word of the Lord. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did, he did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And then from Isaiah um, 54, I should have put a bookmark in. I'll just read it off the back. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. This is the word of the Lord. I want you to imagine for a minute that you were with the disciples and with Jesus as he was transfigured on the mountain. As you've heard the story read here this morning, Picture yourself following Jesus up the mountain, along with Peter, with James, and with John. What do you notice first? What stands out for you? As Jesus and his three disciples near the top of the mountain, his appearance is suddenly changed so that his clothes become so dazzling white that they were whiter than any launderer could have bleached them. The gospel writer Matthew adds that Jesus' face shone like the sun and that his clothes were white as light. Luke tells us that Jesus' clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Now, if this isn't enough to be amazed by, the sudden appearance of Moses and of Elijah, two of the great prophets of the Old Testament, bring the story to a new level. These long-dead prophets stand there talking with Jesus. Matthew and Mark give no details of their conversation. But Luke tells us that they spoke of Jesus' departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. If you were there with the disciples, what would have stood out the most for you? Jesus' transfigured appearance goes beyond that of Moses as he appears before the Israelite people after being in God's presence on Mount Zion. Moses' face had become radiant because he had spoken with the Lord, and the people had been afraid to come near him. He was forced to wear a veil in order to hide the glory of God that was shining through him. Jesus' appearance nearly matches that of the Ancient of Days in the vision recorded in Daniel 7. There, Daniel describes a picture of God with clothing as white as snow, his hair white like wool, and he was sitting on a throne that was flaming like fire. And a river of fire flowed out from before him, while thousands upon thousands attended him. Jesus' appearance on the mountain is definitely unlike anything that we have ever seen before. Unlike anything that we've ever experienced. But this appearance of the two prophets is amazing as well. Did you know that of all the Old Testament prophets, only these two were able to stand in God's presence and to live to tell about it? Moses met, met God on Mount Zion as he led the Israelite people from Egypt into the Promised Land. In Exodus 33, God placed him in the cleft of a rock and then passed before him, shielding him from seeing the full glory of the Lord. And in 1 Kings 19... 
as Elijah flees from Jezebel and ends up on the same mountain that Moses met the Lord. The Lord comes and he shakes the mountain with an earthquake, with a great wind and with a fire. And then he appears to Elijah in the sound of a near silent whisper. These same two prophets ended their prophetic careers under incredibly unique circumstances. Having been prevented from entering the promised land because he struck the rock and claimed that he gave water to the people, God leads Moses up Mount Nebo, where he's given a view of the, the whole promised land, the land that the people would inherit. And then Moses is never heard from nor seen again. At the end of his ministry, Elijah crosses over to the east side of the Jordan River, where he's whisked away by God in a fiery chariot, and he too is never heard from nor seen again. All this, Mark is aware of as he tells the story of Jesus' transfiguration. All this he knows and he wants his reader to understand so that we can grasp the full majesty of the event of Jesus' transfiguration. You see, the story is a bit of a focal point of Jesus' ministry for Mark. The events that Mark records leading up to this point, they build up to this event. And everything he records after it builds up towards Jesus' crucifixion. The transfiguration is a bit of a turning point in Jesus' ministry, where he begins to make his way throughout the countryside, and he turns and he makes his way towards Jerusalem for the very last time. The story of Jesus' transfiguration actually begins in Mark 8, after Jesus heals the blind men in Bethsaida. As he's traveling to the villages or around the town of Caesarea Philippi, he asks his disciples, Who do people say I am? They reply, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. And so Jesus turns and he asks them, But what about you? Who do you say I am? To which Peter answers, You are the Messiah. Then, as they continue to travel, Jesus begins to teach him that the Son of Man must suffer many things, that he must be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days he will rise again from the dead. But Peter can't accept this. He pulls Jesus aside from the group of disciples, and he begins to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he says, this shall never happen to you. Peter can't accept that his Savior is a suffering servant. He came to follow a king. He can't accept that the one he chose to follow, the one that called him away from his fishing boat to become a fisher of men, would willingly lay down his life without even a fight. Peter was ready to fight for what he believed in. He was ready to take up the sword and to defend the one that he believed would be the new king of Israel. He actually did take up the sword when he cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest the night that Jesus was arrested. That's why, as they're up on the mountain, as if Jesus' appearance changes so that even his clothes become as dazzling white, that Peter's the one to speak up. Rabbi, he says, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, tabernacles, he calls them. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter wants to hang on to this moment. He wants to make it last. He's not ready to give up this picture of Christ as king, so he'll do anything to keep them up there on the mountain. He wants to build three separate shelters, dwelling places, where Jesus, where Moses, and where Elijah can stay. But it's clear that Peter doesn't understand what's going on. He doesn't grasp the full significance of what's just happened. He addresses Jesus as rabbi, the same name that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law would use. He's already confessed Jesus as the Messiah, the one sent by God to save his people. But now Peter calls Jesus simply teacher. 
In an offering to build the three tabernacles, Peter treats Moses, Elijah, and Jesus as equals. It's as if the three are all great prophets standing on the mountaintop, and Peter will do all he can to keep them there. Either Peter hasn't heard Jesus' words right before he climbed up the, they climbed the mountain, or he's not ready to accept them. In Mark 8, 34 and 35, Jesus says this, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Jesus is clear about the path that he must follow. He is clear to his disciples that he must suffer at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. He's clear that he will be rejected to the point of death, even death on a cross. And he's clear in his invitation to the disciples to take up their crosses and to follow him. After taking time to study Mark 2, verse 9 through, 2 through 9, Mark 9, verse 2 through 9 this week, it's now the voice of God addressing the disciples on the mountaintop that stands out the most for me. As Peter speaks up, and as he offers to build these three tabernacles, a cloud comes and it covers the top of the mountain. And from within the cloud, the voice of God rings out, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. The voice of God confirms what Peter had already confessed. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the son of God sent to save God's people from their sin. If you truly believe this, then you are called to obey the words of Jesus and to follow him. You're called to take up your cross and to lay down your life, and even if it comes to it, to lose your life for the sake of the gospel. People of God, these words of God that come from the mountaintop, come from the cloud on the mountaintop, are not just for Peter, for James, or for John. They are for us as well. If we truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then we too are called to take up our crosses and to follow him. We too are called to lay down our lives for the sake of the gospel so that others can experience the love of God as well. In Jesus' day, the cross was an object of torture and of humiliation. It was the worst and the most painful way that somebody could die. Not only would you experience the ultimate in physical suffering, but it was a very public display where others could mock you and spit at you as you hung there on the cross. In our day, it'd be a little bit like telling someone to, to go sit in the electric chair. The difference is that the pain of the electric chair is over in a few seconds, while the suffering of the cross is drawn out over hours. Aryan and Kareem, I have to tell you that you picked a, a challenging verse to commemorate Stella's baptism with. Isaiah 54 verse 10 is a beautiful verse that speaks of the unfailing love of God that will not be shaken and of the Lord's covenant of peace that will not be removed. But God speaks these words to his people in a time of suffering and is in a time as they're preparing to be carried off into exile. When God speaks these words through the prophet Isaiah, the people of Israel are far from the mountain of the Lord, and they are far from close fellowship and communion with their Lord and Savior. They have no sense or understanding of the nearness of God, nor have they experienced the glory of God on the mountaintop like Peter, like James, and like John did when Jesus was transfigured. But they still have this promise. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. And so it is my hope this morning that each one here, Stella included, that each one may have mountaintop experiences where you feel close to God, where you understand God's presence as near to you, 
It's my hope that throughout your lifetime, there'll be moments where God makes his presence clear in your lives and even that you can experience his glory in some way. But it is my prayer that even when you're in the valleys of life, even when you feel far from God, even when you experience the darkness of that tunnel that Val was talking about, when you feel far from God or when he leads you down the path of suffering for his name's sake, that you can be assured of the promise that's given in Isaiah 54, verse 10. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed. People of God, the Lord has compassion on you. Even as he calls you to take up your cross and to follow him, he assures you that he will be with you and that he will never leave nor forsake you. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give thanks for this assurance of your presence with us, Lord. Even when we are in the valleys of our lives, Lord, in the darkness of the tunnel, even when we lose our way, we can be assured that you are never far from us, Lord, and we give thanks for that. Lord, we pray that you may draw each one of us close to you. Stella especially, Lord, but each one who's here or who's tuned in via live stream. Make us aware of your presence throughout our lives, Lord, and help us to live our full lives for you, Lord, that, that we may shine your light in the darkness of this world. In your name we pray. Amen.